As the actress said to the bishop, an oft-asked question, why doesn't the Duke of Norfolk live in Norfolk? Some suggest it's because of actors and Roman Catholicism, an unlikely coupling which would give birth to a Norwich institution, the Mother Market Theatre. The Catholic Eighth Duke constructed a grand palace, a curtain call, from the spot where the theatre now stands. An estate agent might have described the district as sought after. Wasn't the mansion now known as Strangers Hall already there? home to rich merchants and mayors of Norwich. Alas, the aforementioned realtor would have been somewhat economical with the truth. One writer, Thomas Baskerville, described the palace as seated in a dunghole place. It hath but little room for gardens, and is pent up on all sides with tradesmen's and dyers' houses, who foul the water by their constant washing and cleaning their cloth. Not only were the neighbours less than fragrant, but the Duke's riverside retreat was plagued by flooding from a river polluted by sewage and the runoff from dyeing works. When, in 1708, the Mayor, fearing anti-Catholic riots, forbade the Duke's company of trumpet-blowing actors to march into Norwich, the noble had had enough. In 1711, he demolished many of the buildings adjoining his palace and departed forever. The parish of St John's Mother Market further declined and remnants of the palace became a workhouse in the 1770s. Then Catholics re-entered the stage. For most of the 18th century, followers of the Bishop of Rome weren't winning popularity contests. Attitudes changed in 1776 when new bogeymen arose. Revolting foreigners. Faced with a shortage of troops to fight American colonists, the government agreed to remove some restrictions on Catholicism, passing the 1778 Papist Act. The consequent Gordon riots merely increased sympathy for Catholics. Emancipation intensified after the French introduced their monarchy to Madame Guillotine. The British establishment smelt risk and opportunity. Britain and its allies exploited the Gallic turmoil by launching the pre-Napoleonic War of the First Coalition, not only intending to seize French territory, but also to halt the spread of populism. The political philosophy of a Norfolk native, Thomas Paine, enthused radicals across the country. These included the Norfolk Revolutionary Society, which held meetings to support the French uprising. The government reacted by suspending habeas corpus and offered support to the French loyalist Armée Catholique et Royale. Nuns and priests fleeing from persecution were welcomed. In 1791, Parliament passed the Catholic Relief Act, allowing the establishment of churches, albeit without the ostentation of spires or bells. The stage was set for the construction of such an establishment in Norwich. Strangers Hall could no longer boast of being the city's premier des res. Parts were sublet and it saw service as a boarding school before its purchase by wine merchant Robert Suffield. The Catholic vintner was happy to provide his church with land behind the hall. In 1794 a new chapel held its first mass. It was dedicated to St John the Baptist, a choice that invited confusion with the Anglican edifice across St John's Alley. Could it be an omen that William Kemp, Shakespeare's clown, ended his nine days wonder in 1600 by leaping over the wall between the two buildings? Externally, the restrictions on steeples meant the new structure was bland and uninteresting. Internally, the new building was impressive. Some suggest the Sistine Chapel influenced the design. In 1797, the church expanded its property portfolio when a committee of Catholic priests purchased Strangers Hall, which became the presbytery for the new church. 
it was a buyer's market. The prosperity Norwich enjoyed for most of the 18th century came to a juddering halt in the 1790s, further inflaming the spirit of radicalism. Family-run textile businesses couldn't compete with the mechanisation of the cotton trade in the north of England, and unemployment soared. The new chapel came into being in what must have been a troubled city. St John's remained a Catholic church in Norwich for a hundred years, although it lost its place as the primary site of worship to the Holy Apostles' Chapel in Willow Lane. But it faced its final curtain after the intervention of... Who else? The Duke of Norfolk. To celebrate his marriage, the 15th incumbent financed the construction of a grander St John's on the site of the old Norwich jail. It proved so grand that in 1976 it became the second cathedral in the city. In 1896, the old St John's and Strangers Hall were put up for auction, falling into the hands of property speculator John Rout. Leonard Bolingbroke of the Norwich and Norfolk Archaeological Society bought Strangers Hall, leaving the former church to survive as a warehouse and Salvation Army Citadel before being abandoned to its fate. Exit Catholics, enter actors. It's apt that the former holy edifice was redeemed from the limbo of dereliction by a monk, coincidentally the son of a vicar. Shakespeare's presence on the English stage had subsided in the early years of the 20th century. The productions of Sir Henry Irvine proved too elaborate and long due to the logistics of rearranging complex scenery. By 1920, West End performances of the Bard's work were limited to a musical version of The Merchant of Venice, composed by Sir Thomas Beecham's teenage son. But, just as the extravagance of progressive rock would spawn the rise of punk, a new wave emerged. Actor-manager William Pole had formed the Elizabethan Stage Society, intended to produce 16th century drama as first performed, fast-paced, scant scenery and no changes to text. In 1902 he hired Walter Nugent Monk as stage manager. Monk, a dedicated disciple of Pole, arrived in Norwich in 1909 to direct a series of historical tableaux in St Andrew's Hall. Perhaps the ambience of the former church and priory captivated him, for he stayed in the city, venturing only occasionally to other parts to direct. In 1910 he formed his own company to continue Pole's philosophy, Nugent Monk's Players. In May 1911 he rebranded them as the Guild of Norwich Players. The first local performances took place in Monk's home off Bethel Street, where he could accommodate an audience of around 70. Growing demand forced him to seek larger premises, and he chose the old music room, now part of Wensum Lodge off King Street, where a hundred could watch the performances. Having performed over 20 plays, Monk's company disbanded at the start of the Great War, and only returned to the music room in 1919. Monk had joined the Army Medical Corps, but could not resist theatrical production. There are accounts of his instructing his soldier actors on how to make armour out of bully beef tins. The first three years after the armistice saw a growing confidence in the nation. The Roaring Twenties emerged, driven by the increased independence of women. The Derby was broadcast on radio. In Norwich, the Picture House on Haymarket reopened with a capacity of 1,687. The Norwich players attracted capacity audiences and Monk realised he needed a larger theatre. His initial reaction on entering the disused church off St John's Alley was disappointment until he enunciated this opinion to his companions and experienced the remarkable acoustics of the Sistine Chapel-influenced interior. Realising the existing gallery might replicate an Elizabethan type space, he purchased the building. The old chapel would be reborn in a confident city, far different to the mood during its first incarnation. 
On Monday the 19th of September 1921, after only six weeks restoration, the Norwich players performed As You Like It at the new Mother Market Theatre. W.B. Yeats was a guest at the event. One critic lauded the theatre as The first building in England since the Commonwealth, definitely built with an apron stage and gallery on the old model. By this plan, plays can be performed without interval or interruption. Although the absence of the customary proscenium and footlights may seem strange to some modern playgoers. Monk wished to install a true Elizabethan thrust stage, but his budget was insufficient. As early as 1922, the Sunday Mirror described the Madder Market as one of the most important theatres in England. Under Monk's direction, described by his successor as a benevolent dictatorship, the theatre prospered. Not even the Second World War could force it to cease its work. In 1952, the 75-year-old Monk announced he would retire and relinquish his leading role in favour of Lionel Dunn. He sold the theatre to the trustees but retained influence by joining them. Success rendered the auditorium's capacity of 220 inadequate and the trustees agreed to expand the auditorium to seat another 100 spectators, besides other improvements. All that stood in their way were funding and a dilapidated set of buildings known as Farnell's Court, lying between the theatre and Pottergate, accessible via a narrow passage leading to St John's Alley. A loan was arranged and Farnell's Court vanished into history. The theatre defied superstition by reopening on Friday the 13th of November 1953 with a performance of Twelfth Night. The Madder Market might have had an ecclesiastical past, but Dunn and Monk didn't sing from the same hymn sheet. Dunn promised various conventional practices would be introduced, causing Monk to express his distaste at these changes including his successor's insistence on playing the national anthem after each performance. Unsurprisingly, Dunn left the next year, citing a difference of opinion with the trustees. The next producer, Roos Evans, lasted a year. There is a legend of a ghostly priest haunting the theatre, but there is no doubt it was a living monk whose presence refused to leave his successors alone until his death in October 1958, shortly after he returned to direct Elizabethan patchwork. Even then, Monk did not stray far. His ashes are interred in the neighbouring St John's Anglican Church. In 1962, the roof fell in, literally. Eight tonnes of debris were removed and trustees launched another appeal to pay for repairs. Unfortunately, the cathedral again competed for funds, but the matter market triumphed. So much so that in 1965 the trustees embarked on another expansion, this time to build a bar area, resulting in the present structure. A more recent change was the 1990 extension of the stage to create the thrust platform Monk couldn't finance. The Norwich players, now the matter market theatre company, still flourish. They became the first company in the world to perform the entire recognised Shakespeare canon when they beat the Royal Shakespeare Company to stage the double falsehood. The Madder Market is an established presence on the professional touring circuit, hosting everything from stand-up comedy to hard rock. Their Mad Red Company provides opportunities for people of all ages to explore the world of drama. In 2021, the Madder Market celebrates its centenary as a theatre. It's about to have spent more time in that role than as a place of worship. It is one of the great treasures, not just of Norwich, but of British theatre. Although the Madder Market will never win awards for architectural elegance, it's a mishmash of extensions to a building forced by law to be banal. That's not the point. As the Bard wrote, the play's the thing.